Hey everybody, <laughs> welcome to the Professor Simon live streaming and particularly welcome Patreons. And um, if you are seeing this and hearing it, let me know in the comment. I assume you can, I've done various tests. It uh, seems to be working, but um, let me know. <laughs> So today, what are we going to talk about? Well, this session is going to be rather experimental. I would like to do a live chat, every, say, the last Sunday of every month to sum up films and discuss films that have come up and have been made in the last month and to answer any questions. I'm going to focus the chat on questions asked by my wonderful Patreons. So today I've asked the Patreons to set me some questions uh, to kick this live streaming off. And I thought I would dig right in with the question <laughs> number one. Um, and that is, how did I first join the BBC? <laughs> well, it was a while ago, and I've now retired, but I went straight to the BBC from art school in Sheffield. I left art college on a Friday and started at Ealing Film Studios, which is television film studios, BBC, on a Monday. But let's rewind a bit and see how did I get the job. I was really smartly advised by somebody. I wanted to study film and everybody said, go to Sheffield. Sheffield had some of the best equipment and the best tutors to make films. They, to use a good British word, they were a documentary socialist filmmaking school. Suited me down to the ground. They had Ariflex cameras. They had a fantastic rostrum setup, and uh, they were very connected with industry. Although we made our own films, we also made films for the Sheffield City Council. We made a whole series of films about little meisters. Little meisters are individual craftspeople like knife grinders and um, die sinkers who carve the dies for the steel industry. And it was just such a good education. But the other thing was almost everybody who had done the course previous to me in the mid-70s were working in the film and TV industry. So a mate who was in an older year was a film editor at Pebble Mill for the BBC. And I said, can I join the BBC? And he said, well, I'll set you up with a holiday relief job at um, Pebble Mill and come down for a week and be a trainee assistant film editor, see if you like it. So I went, yeah, great. So this was late 70s. My, this is a bit of background. My graduation film was a film about punk rock. And I think I looked a bit punky. I was obviously 19. I think I wore t-shirts and jeans and had spiky hair, not white hair. And um, I turned up at Pebble Mill and the manager there, the film operations manager, hated me. He said, who are you? And I said, uh, Simon, a friend of Martin's. I've come for a holiday relief job. And he went, we don't want punks here. I went, oh, OK. <laughs> and he just just ignored me for a whole week. But while I was there in the Pebble Mill canteen, on the notice board was jobs available at the BBC. And one of the jobs was trainee assistant film editor, London, based at Ealing Film Studios. Ooh, that sounded good. <laughs> so I applied, got an interview, and um, went for an interview at Ealing Film Studios. And the first question they asked me was this hilarious. They knew that I'd had a work placement at, um, at Pebble Mill. 
and they'd got a reference from this guy, the film operations manager, who said, and it was, quote, they read it out because they thought it was so funny. They said, never give this guy a job. He is a punk. And I was drastically interviewed in a suit and a tie that I'd probably borrowed and proper shoes. And they said, are you a punk? And I went, uh, no, not really. And they just laughed and laughed and laughed and um, gave me the job. I was just so pleased. Head of personnel, when they sent me a letter saying, congratulations, you are now a trainee assistant film editor for the BBC, also said there were 25,000 applicants and we took on 12 people. So I don't know what I did right, but I swanned into what was the Ealing Film Studios. And I was so impressed because I'm such a big fan of Ealing comedies like The Lady Killers and uh, you know, The Lavender Hill Mob. And there was Ealing Film Studios, now owned by the BBC and called Television Film Studio. And for the first, I think, seven or eight weeks, we were in a classroom learning all the techniques of film editing, edge numbers, optical printers. How does a laboratory work? all that kind of stuff, which I hadn't really learned to art college and seemed super professional. Plus, they um, showed us around the whole of the BBC. So we had a bit of an overview of everything from engineering, production, um, through to studios and transmission. So we, it, was, it was a really good course. And then when you finished the course, there was no exam. It was just some information. You became a trainee assistant film editor. And that carried on for about a year, I believe, and was probably, this was 1978, and it was probably one of the best times in my working career. Um, I just got to work on everything. Memorable programs would be Doctor Who and Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, where I was, it was super busy. I was the assistant editor's assistant. And a um, funny story. So as a trainee, the editor that you're assigned to is given a piece of paper to, to fill out how is the trainee assistant. And he you know, ticked all the boxes. But one of the questions was, how does Simon take criticism? Well, bless his socks, Chris, the editor, didn't know. So he sent me to the canteen for a cup of tea and a wholesome cake. And I went to the BBC canteen and all they had was fairy cakes with fluffy bits. There was no kind of Bakewell tarts. So I got my fairy cake because that's all they had and a cup of tea. And I brought it back and he went, what's that? And I said, it's a fairy cake. And he threw it at my head. <laughs> I and bless my socks, I said to him, F off. <laughs> and Chris said, oh, takes criticism badly. And of course, it was a bit of a joke and we laughed about it. And it was like, yeah, thanks, Chris. But no, it was a really, really evil thing he did. Because in my long career at the BBC, you have something called annual interviews with your personnel officer. And they check how you're doing and if you need any changes and your pension and things. And they go over any um, reports that have been made. And every single year, like 10 years later, the personnel officer was saying, you still take criticism badly? I was saying, no, he threw a cake at my head. <laughs> so anyway, it was fabulous working on Tinker Taylor, and um, I'm still in touch with most of the people. Sadly, one of the film editors um, recently died while here in France. Uh, she was fantastic, but I look back at that uh, series with, w with joy. <laughs> a funny story about it. One of your jobs as the trainee is to answer the phone, not to distract the assistant or the film editor who are busy. And so you would pick it up and go, hello, Tinker Taylor cutting room? And it was American. And they said, hey, buddy, thanks for the substandard, which is what they call 16 mil, interneg. Please send the 35 mil negs immediately of the Tinker Taylor series. 
And I'm just like the crazy assistant. And I knew the truth. I sent, but it was shot on 16 millimeter. There's no 35 millimeter negatives. And the guy went ballistic at me. I remember on the phone, this is somebody from Paramount going, what? You've, you've got all those famous actors and you shot it on substandard 16 mil. I went, uh, yeah, is this a problem? And he went, big problem. Put me onto your boss. I went, oh, Chris. <laughs> and lots of good memories. After being a trainee and working just on everything, you become an assistant where your job is things like syncing up daily rushes and just generally dealing with everything that your editor needs. You run the cutting room, the editor does the editing. And it's a fantastically important job. And then I got to work on just so many iconic programs, the two Ronnies, um, as I said, Doctor Who. Um, and I then became really interested in sound. And I still am to this day. And I got early promotion to become a sound editor because the series Bergerac, John Nettle set in Jersey, needed a sound editor. And what that job entailed was taking the just the dialogue track that was edited and adding all the music, all the sound effects, all the foleys, and taking it through the sound mixing process um, with the director and the editors when they attended and producing the final soundtrack and also the music and effects track and all that. And, and that, that was a really good promotion for me. And I, to this day, I enjoyed sound editing. I then went on to work on um, the Agatha Christie Miss Marple series as the sound editor for a couple of years, and, and that was fantastic. I really liked that. But my real love was always science and documentaries. So an opportunity came up in the late 70s, early 80s um, to get into video editing as a film editor and get retrained to use um, half-inch videotape equipment. And I was young and foolish and up for it. And um, so I volunteered for a course at what is BBC Evesham, um, which is a um, research and training facility in the Cotswolds. Fantastic place really great tutors and they have a secret bunker underneath if there's ever a nuclear war the bbc transmit from the underground bunker at evesham staffed by whoever is on the course but i didn't get to go down to the bunker but what i did learn is an awful lot about videotape and because i was one of the few film editors who knew about videotape they offered me a job on Panorama, and that was just fantastic. So I was on uh, Panorama during the whole of the 1980s. Can you imagine a more interesting political time? Literally, just from the from the the rubbish strike and the downfall of socialism, and Margaret Thatcher being elected. And that, that was just so important. And Ronald Reagan and the strategic arms limitation talks and the troubles in Northern Ireland, the miners' strike, you know, flying pickets. And for 10 years, I edited in Lime Grove, which is um, a studio in West London um, on Panorama. Technologically, it's really interesting because we did actually start on Ektachrome, 16 mil reversal like slide film, uh, which had gone through the camera and you had to be very careful with it. And then we very soon changed to half inch beta, which was probably f terrible resolution if you look back. And then soon came out beta SP with two and three machine half inch decks and an edit controller, which I really liked, um, but it has its um, problems. And then 
just as I left, the non-linear, N-L-E, non-linear editing, on, uh, mainly on Avid Media Composer, came out. And now, today, everything is non-linear editing. And uh, I particularly liked going to non-linear editing and Avid Media Composer because it was like going back to a film cutting room where instead of laying down shots sequentially and not being able to go back into a sequence and change something in the middle, you could, with film you can just undo a splice and put a new shot in or shorten and lengthen stuff. But with tape, you can't do that. But with non-linear editing, you can change everything. It was like film editing, but on a computer. But to show my age, when we first started, uh, we did the whole film on a nine gigabyte hard drive that was the size of a shoebox. And I think they were 18,000 pounds each. Crumbs. <laughs> now, I edit films for you on Final Cut Pro. It costs a couple of hundred bucks. It's it's 4K full broadcast resolution, and I'm editing on a six terabyte solid state drive, which costs 200 euros. How the world has changed. <laughs> All right. Well, that's that's that's. I I then left the BBC and became a freelance editor. That but that's a story for another day. But I got a second question from Patreon, and that was, "How? what is it like working with a difficult or an easy producer? This is um, uh, a really good question, and it's obviously from somebody who works in the media, because um, it's, um, it's very relevant, because my answer is is a bit different. First of all, let me explain. In television, directors are producers because they're also in charge of their budget. Uh, they don't just direct. So a pr TV producer uh, directs and is in charge of the whole project. And that's who you as a film editor you work with. And of course, some producers are uh, very organized, know exactly what they want. And some are disorganized and don't know what they want but that's not the criteria for being a good or a bad producer in my books. A cutting room, working with a film editor, is a very intense, very strong relationship between you and this creative person. And for me, a good producer was somebody, they didn't necessarily know what they wanted, but they appreciated you as the film editor to bring out the best in their film and getting on with them. And so I used to turn the tables on producers who would often ask for a CV from the film editor. And I would say, yeah, sure, you can have my CV, but let's meet for a drink in the wine bar, Albertine's Wine Bar on Wood Lane. And see how we get on, because we're going to be in a very small uh, room together for six to eight weeks, trying to make the best out of your film. And our relationship is more important than anything. So for me to answer the question, what's a good or a bad producer, is a good producer is somebody I literally like, somebody I understand, somebody I can empathize with. And a bad producer might be incredibly well organized, incredibly direct, um, but they're the type of person who will sit next to you in the cutting room and snap their fingers going one frame further back. Well, for me, and I, I guess almost every film editor, they are a nightmare. <laughs> so you don't want to work with them. You want to work with people that you actually empathize with and like. Right, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn my head and read your very kind comments that you've written in so far. So, welcome Lee, welcome Ink Drop Falls, of course, um, uh, Mick K, fantastic, Blue Moon, yeah, Ed McIntosh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Honestly, Chris, I'm not going to tell you his surname, threw a fairy cake at me, Ed. 
Um, yeah, Lee cakes as criticism, absolutely, and and the cake stuck with me. <laughs> Mr. Noodles, yeah, thank you. This is just the first stream, Mr. Noodles, and um, if it's kind of popular and I get lots of interesting questions um, that I can answer, I'll do more. So, yeah, but come back. I propose to do another one just like this in, say, a month's time. Yeah, um, I'm glad uh, Gafouk is happy that I'm live. Earfront um, is very envious that I worked on Doctor Who. Yeah, I can't really remember what, what the series was. It was at the time when Doctor Who was really low budget and the sets were wobbly. And I remember the film editor I was assisting because she had a, a silly little dog that only drank sterilized milk. That's all I remember. And I remember the it was in black and white. So it, it was a while ago. Um, uh, Lola Wimbury, thank you so much for your super chat. called BBC Porn, uh, but it's spelled P-A-W-N. <laughs> I can't remember what it stands for, but it's not porn, it's porn. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Earfront, are you actually a professor? Or is it just your name or a cool handle? I think this is worth clearing up. Um, okay, I, I don't have a doctorate, I'm not a PhD professor, but that's what I think a lot of people think professors are. But I have taught at universities and other colleges at higher education level as a senior educator. And if you look up the term professor, um, it says a senior educator who works in higher education. So I've only done a bit. So it's a bit of a pseudonym. And um, I certainly don't specialize in any subject. And my background is in science and history in television and film. So you decide. <laughs> um, yeah. Lee Norris, what's your favorite story on this channel so far? That's good. That's a good question. Occasionally I look back to over, I think there's over a couple of hundred films that I've made in the last four years. And there's definitely good ones and there's definitely bad ones there. Um, some of the ones I enjoy are silly ones. I remember making a film on toast I quite liked. Um, but I think... YouTube has given me the opportunity to make films that I know that broadcasters wouldn't touch. I mean, a classic subject is anything to do with UFOs or UAPs. I mean, they just don't go near it because they're so scared of being tarred with a kind of ufology brush. And uh, it, by the way, it's, it's quite a serious brush to be tarred with. And UFO people are pretty serious about UFOs. But I like the freedom on YouTube to do what I want to do without having executive producers or a TV channel saying, yeah, can't discuss plasma and UFOs. Oh, yes, you can. You can do it on YouTube. So I think over the years, there's been a couple of good films that I've quite enjoyed. I liked um, the film on um, raising the K129, the Azorian project with Howard Hughes. That was a film I always wanted to do. I remember feeling very tricked as a child, thinking that there were manganese nodules on the seabed when in fact it was a CIA plot scam. And um, that was a film made with passion. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit of a naughty story about that. Am I? I'm going to allude to a naughty story. All right, so the after I made the film on the raising of the submarine and the whole Azorian project, and that is the correct code name. Um, I got an 
email through a secure email channel from somebody who basically was involved in the project and told me a lot of stuff which he shouldn't have told me because um, it's still classified. And I said, I read it, of course, but, but I'm not going to share it. And I said, please don't send still classified documents. And what's interesting, uh, maybe one day the whole project of raising the nuclear submarine with the Howard Hughes boat will be declassified. But the film I made isn't all correct. <laughs> and that's all I'm going to say. All right. Oh, thanks, Blue Moon. Yeah, I'm pleased you can hear me and see me. By the way, this is our 16th century water mill in southwest France where Dorothy and I live with our animals. This room that you're seeing behind you is interesting because it's actually an 18th century room. Originally, um, it had a very high peaked ceiling and this structure uh, of beams is called a mansard roof. And so you have this sloping uh, wall and then a high roof and it it gives you extra headroom and it was the Ikea um, conversion of um, of the 18th century I guess and it, it's it's great all these beams were not original to the house and they're all numbered and they were made off site the roof was taken off and then this is the top floor it, it was put on so uh, we use it um, when we do Airbnb as an Airbnb room. But uh, since the COVID epidemic, we haven't really been doing Airbnb and I've been using it to make films for you. So <laughs> that's, that's where I am. Um, Ink Drop Falls. Is there a film or movie that, uh, that has any profound effect in your work or ideas? Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a great question, and um, basically you're asking what's my favorite movie, and it's really easy. I've never seen a better film, and it's a film about humans. It's a film about editing very much. Um, it has a great backstory. The film wasn't going to get made, although it was a brilliant script, and the director... Uh, Mr. Coppola um, was only allowed, Francis Ford, was only allowed to make it because he promised to make Godfather 2. So while he was directing Godfather 2, he hired one of the best film editors in the world to work on this film which is unbelievably brilliantly edited. It is the best edited film. It has some of the best acting and I think one of the most intelligent scripts ever written. Uh, it's also Harrison Ford's first film. And it's, of course, The Conversation. Go out and rent it today. It's, it, it's a film about film editing and it's a film about perception and it's very much a film about dialogue i mean the classic um scene in the film is the film is centered around this recorded eavesdropped conversation at the beginning of the film which is completely bland and meaningless but as the film unwinds you learn details and you learn context and individual words in what appeared to be very um, simple and naive take on a more sinister meaning right up to a, a kind of very climatic ending the conversation go and see it yeah <laughs> all right uh, okay, Gafuk, he likes the miniature steam engines. Well, I do. It's my hobby. I have a workshop in the basement here where I have a mini lathe made by Proxon, a mill made by Proxon, um, a horizontal bandsaw, and I'm very lucky uh, in 
be able to get lots of um, aluminium aluminum for American friends stock and make mini steam engines. For many years, I never did much with my lathe until I came across the wigwag engine. Wigwag engines are designed by this brilliant engineer called Aid Swash. Aid transformed my workshop. He made me believe I could make an oscillating steam engine. I've now made 12. So yeah, thank you, Aid. And yeah, no, I really enjoy the steam engines. All right. <laughs> mm. uh, uh, other questions? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, great to see you here, Aid. Um, if it wasn't for you, Aid, <laughs> I wouldn't be making, oops, excuse me, Aid. I wouldn't be making flywheels like this. And go to Aid's channel right now because Aid's brilliantly volunteered to climb a effing mountain in Wales to raise money for Ukrainian refugees and the whole Ukrainian crisis and he's doing a great job and a number of us have contributed and go and check AIDS channel if also you want to build your own steam engine you don't need many tools he publishes plans and they are really doable so good one good one AIDS Best indie movie from um, Mick K. Um, I like all indie movies, really. Um, for a short time, um, I lived in Hawaii. Uh, Dorothy, my lovely wife, is from Hawaii. And um, she said um, she doesn't work in film. Uh, she's a statistician and an artist. And she said to me one day, she said, uh, you know that guy next door? I went, oh yeah, that weird guy who dresses in all black, looks like a bit like a cowboy. He goes, yeah, he directed some movie. I went, well, she says I have no idea. I said, what's his name? So she told me his name, I can't remember. And he directed the best indie movie I think I've ever seen, which is um, a film called Two Lane Blacktop. So I was like way impressed that he lived next door. So that's another, it's a road movie uh, made in the 70s. So um, Mick K, that's my favorite indie movie because I live next door to the director. <laughs> uh, hi, Professor. Do you need to review your live setup? Most live broadcasts are, are face the camera and have a screen in front of them out of sight, which they can see from the audience. Um, yeah, let me tell you how I got here today. First of all, this is the setup um, that I use for filming uh, with my Canon um, DLSR with a nice Sigma Art F1 lens and a decent microphone. But a week ago, I decided to do live streaming so I went out and bought a um, Logitech um, webcam and put it on top of my monitor um, to use a good word in French it was merde <laughs> it was a horror it looked like a zoom call it was way wide it was infinite focus but mainly the audio was merde it was really bad, and um, I thought, I want to look a bit better than that. And thank you very much, a shout-out to Matthew O'Brien from Midland Pictures, who's a good mate and a good channel. And, and Matthew said to me, why don't you use your Canon camera? I went, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> I'm a bit old and a bit of a Luddite. And Matthew set me up uh, with an HDMI to USB um, connector and told me how to plug in my pro microphone 
So I thought I would um, use this camera and this decent microphone. The only thing that I would say is I think the audio level on this microphone is a tiny bit low compared with most um, YouTube videos. I don't know if you find that. Somebody already said that, I noticed. And um, I don't have an audio mixer and my Mac is on 100% audio level, so I don't really know how to make it any louder, but over the coming live broadcast, I'll try and improve. And maybe I will change the setup so I can see the screen without having to look over there. That would be good because obviously the screen is here and I have to um, look over <laughs> to look at. Uh, um, Deja. Oops, I'm late to the party. Oh, no. You're not late to the party, Deja. What's to know about things on my desktop? Well, yeah, there's some really cool things. This is one of my coolest. Dorothy, my darling wife, bought me a Playmobil Professor Simon for Christmas. <laughs> and just a couple of days ago, she bought me Wallace the goat and a lemur. So there's lots of cool things on my desktop. Wallace is cool, isn't he? And um, these are organic, how to make organic molecules from a kit which really aren't very expensive and they're so cool to play with that it doesn't exist that's not a real it's it's element 95 from area 51 no it's not it's just me sticking um red and blue balls together and um i have a thing from my childhood that some of you might recognize my meccano tin <laughs> and of course, my uh, dinosaur, I've forgotten what he's called, but I worked in a film about him. He has a head that makes infrasound. It was a Discovery Channel film. That's all I remember. And of course, the robot there is, for a short time, I um, was sent... Um, toys and models by this um, company in China. I say a short time because they've stopped. <laughs> and uh, the, it took me a whole day making films for them and they were not appreciative, but not in a financial sense. <laughs> so I've got a couple of robots, but um, I don't work for them anymore. I'll go back just to making my own steam engines. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased, uh, Lola, that the sound's good. It's good. This is a uh, a decent cardioid microphone. Oh, something funny about this. When I first plugged it in, it sounded atrocious because cardioid microphones um, only go out there and there, and I was speaking into the side of it. <laughs> so... Um, that didn't work, but this does. Uh, all right, Pilk. Pil Hi, Professor. Hope you're having a great Sunday. I'm having a fantastic Sunday. It's beautiful weather here in France, and I've got my electric bike back on the road. And I went out this morning, had lunch, and then I went out this afternoon. I've actually drained the battery. It's got 40 kilometer range, and I've drained it. So, yeah, it, it's fantastic. I think yesterday I made a short film on a bicycle ride about um, this guy who has a street named after him nearby. I'll do more. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's good. And I hope everything's going good with you guys and you're enjoying um, early summer almost. <laughs> yeah. So, the, yep. Ear front. Hi. The robot is a remote controlled robot uh, from China, which they sent me to build and it, it went together pretty well. And uh, you can drive it around with uh, an app. Um, and 
if you want. Uh, it's from sterlingkit.com. Not that they're my best friends right now, but if you go to sterlingkit.com and use the code Simon, not Professor Simon, just Simon, they'll give you 10% off the price of the robot. If, if you want it. Um, Surak from the planet Vulcan. I can't do that. Am I preparing for the flood season? That's obviously somebody who knows about flooding around here. So we live in a water mill and we have a small river that runs under the house and it joins at the bottom of the garden pretty well. It joins a big river called the Dordogne River, which is enormous. And for the last three years in February, we've had a flood that has inundated the garden. Um, one year it got so serious we had to put the sheep in our car. Yeah, you can imagine. Um, and drive the car to the top of the driveway the next morning. You don't want to see the car. Anyway, anyway, it's now March. This year we haven't had a flood. And I think we're probably out of flood season. Um, it's quite dramatic, but it is a water mill, so it's designed to have water underneath the house, and it's about two metres up from the river level. So as long as the Dordogne doesn't rise more than about two metres, um, we won't get water in the house. Yeah, good. Uh David Salisbury. Hi, David. David, I must thank you very much for all your smart comments over the years. Thank you. The sound quality is great. Just a notch, no, a, a, a notch lower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure how to make it um, louder. Uh, maybe I need a microphone or maybe I need to shout. No, I think that would be pathetic. Um, um a good question here from Ink Drop Falls. Top man. Flying. Yes. <laughs> you really want to know about flying? I do. Right. So flying's a r real passion of mine. How did I get into flying? Because I'm a film editor. All right. Everything you do in film and video is virtual. You feel as if you've traveled to a foreign country with the world about us. You feel as if you've um, been to a volcano erupting on a horizon film. But in fact, you sat in a small dark room and uh, edited the film. But flying is the complete opposite. You are in control of your own destiny. And so I was bought a... Um, one of these half hour flight experiences for my birthday. So I thought, so I turned up this little airport and there was this extremely young woman. She was about 18 and she said, I'm your flight instructor. I went, oh, okay, <laughs> good. There's your plane, looked terrible. And she said, and I said, where are you going to take me? She said, I'm not going to take you anywhere. You were you were bought a half hour flight training course. You are going to fly the plane. Eh? Me? <laughs> I can't fly. She said, I'll teach you. Oh, she's fantastic. It was her last day as a CFI, a chief flying instructor. She was joining to show my age, Caledonian Airways, the next day as a first officer. What an amazing woman. She showed me what to do. We, t we taxied, took off down the runway. We flew over Norfolk. Uh, she said uh, her boyfriend wasn't picking her up for an hour. So instead of just having half an hour, she could see that I was enjoying the flight so much. Why didn't we fly out over to the coast and look at some seals? And she showed me how to do steep turns and we stalled the plane and we landed and I basically got out the plane and said, sign me up. I want to be a pilot. And um, unfortunately, she had 
was leaving, so I went back the following week for my first lesson, and I hated the instructor. <laughs> he was terrible. So it took me a while to find somebody who can work with me. Maybe I'm a bit different, a bit difficult. And eventually I found this retired guy um, from Reuters, who was a, a, a pilot and an instructor um, in Andrewsfield, which is on the outskirts of Stansted Airport. And he taught me to fly in England. Um, but then I moved to the United States and um, flying there was a joy. I bought a Cessna 152, an amazing Cessna, and flew everywhere from California to the Midwest in this tiny Cessna. My favorite Cessna story is um, I bumped into, this is a bit of a name drop, I bumped into Jim Lovell from Apollo 13, as you do when you're a pilot. And I said, Jim, Jim, where's the command module from Apollo 13? And he said, it's in a warehouse in, uh, in, uh, te in, in uh, Kansas. I went, can I come and see it? And he said, yeah, anytime. I'm always down there. I said, I will fly down. And I did. I flew all the way from Wisconsin, the Midwest where I lived, down to this um, place called Hutchinson, Kansas, and met Jim. And he showed me the inside of the Apollo 13 command module, the one that had a problem. Fantastic. And um, I really, really have enjoyed flying. I know there's another question about flying is what is what has been um, my hairiest moment in a plane. I have had a number of hairy moments in planes. <laughs> But the number one hairy moment is classic. So I sold the Cessna, which I regret, and bought a Piper Cherokee because it had four seats that were slightly um, more powerful. And um, it was pretty old. That's all I could afford. And one day while flying um, to an air show, um, over the top of a coal-fired power station, this is the relevant bit, there was a horrible smell of burning. And I was looking out the window going, that power station is such a polluter. And then I turned my head back and my whole of my airplane was full of smoke. The control panel um, was on fire. That's a scary moment. So what did I do? Well, I was 15 miles north of a large international airport with um, ambulances, not ambulances, fire engines and a big control tower. Um, and I was about five miles south of a small airport that I knew quite well. So I decided to go to the small airport because training kicked in and I turned off all the electrical power because it smelled like an electrical burning. Um, the fire went out I had no radios. The engine keeps going because it runs on a magneto. And I landed on this uh, runway with the airport manager running out saying, What's, why didn't you call us on the radio? And I said, my plane's on fire. And it turned out that this Piper Cherokee had a really badly built um, audio panel and it, it had shorted out and it had burnt some wires. It wasn't that serious my mechanic drove out later that day took out the burnt wires and said oh you're okay to go and i had just about the hairiest flight home thinking it was going to burst into flames on my way home but it didn't and um we fixed the plane so yeah planes on fire is worse than snakes <laughs> on, a, on a on a plane <laughs> mr roberto Houston, my plane, that one that caught fire, is now in Houston, Texas. So it's called, its tail number is November 555906. It's a Cherokee. So if you see a beautiful hand painted airplane, a Piper Cherokee in Houston, it's my old plane. So say hi to the guy who bought it in Texas. I hope, it, I hope he's pleased with it. Yeah. <laughs>
Oh, Jeff Plywood. Uh, I'm very happy to tell you about Jim Lovell. He's a super, super, super nice guy. Unlike Chuck Yeager, who's miserable. <laughs> anyway, yeah, Jim Lovell's a really super nice guy. He's now 90. It's just his birthday this week. He's 92, so long may he be amongst us. He also told me a great story. He said, who did a better job than Charles Lindbergh? I went, who could be better than Charles Lindbergh, Jim? And he went, the man who flew from California to Hawaii. I went, why? He said, Charles Lindbergh was going to Paris and he went to Ireland, if you remember the film and the truth. You can't miss the island of Hawaii or else you would die in the Pacific. So, yeah, yeah, the person who... Fl it's almost the same distance from the East Coast to Europe, from the West Coast out to Hawaii, and finding the island of Hawaii and landing at Honolulu took real skill, and, and, and Jim recognized that. Sadly, we don't remember that pilot's name. I don't. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, this person got to fly the space shuttle simulator. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I have a space shuttle story. So my um, good mate, who is a pilot in Wisconsin, uh, he uh, is an instrument instructor, and I was taking some instrument lessons to become a you know a more professional pilot. And he took his lessons at the Space Center, you know, Cape Canaveral in Florida at Merritt Island. And he would do space shuttle approaches to the long runway at the, uh, at the space, sh at, at, at Cape Canaveral when it wasn't being used. So I've never done that, but yeah, of course. Who wouldn't like to go up in the... STS, built by the lowest bidder. Ooh, it worries me, that thing, actually. And as you know, it's not a NASA project. It's a secret military NSA satellite vehicle. But you, you know I know that. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Pilk, pulk, yeah, yeah. Parabolic maneuvers in a plane are um, t not to be taken lightly. Um, airplanes can do them, and you can become weightless, um, hopefully intentionally. But the problem with all maneuvers that are um, what you call not one G, that are negative G weightless or plus g feeling heavy is it stresses the airframe so every airplane that you fly you should know if it can pull either plus or negative g's so don't do parabolic maneuvers in a standard cessna 172 um, if you do it too much you'll rip the wings off and that's uh, not that would be a very bad day. Um, Blue Moon. Hawaii is the most isolated place on Earth. It is. It is. I never knew that. When I first met Dorothy and I flew out to Hawaii for the first time, I mean, I'd worked in movies about Hawaii, but I assumed that you went to San Francisco, you got on a little plane, maybe a Hawaiian plane, and you nipped out to the island, like the Canary Islands, just off, no, it's miles away. It's 3,000 miles from the west coast of the US. It's a really long way in the middle of the Pacific, fascinating place. So I guess I'm gonna ask you guys a question. What is the next nearest inhabited place to Hawaii? Um, the first person who answers it in the comments gets a double thumbs up from me. Okay. 
uh, Mike Key had is only flying less than over Loch Ness. Oh, Loch Ness is pretty wild and a good a good place um, um, to fly. <laughs> and oh, great to hear from you. Greetings from uh, to Mil my mates in Milwaukee. Hey, favorite city in the U.S. Brilliant place. And um, Mr. Bong's Lab and Aid both get a thumbs up. Yep. The nearest inhabited place to Hawaii is 248 miles away, occasionally, and it's the ISS. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Mark Hunt, no, Fiji is a really, really long way away, but it is a nearest island, but it's not, it's the... And and Everett Newman Tonga, no Tonga's another fantastic place. Um, we used to have neighbours who were from Tonga, but no. <laughs> right. Well, I have now prattled on for a long time, and um, Lightning Rod Thunder Bay. Just imagine living in Thunder Bay, the Dew Line. How fantastic! <laughs> and um, Christmas Island. I'm not sure where Christmas Island is. I think it might. It sounds like it might be in the Pacific, but no, it's the ISS. And Tristan Jacuna, um, yeah, is probably a very isolated place, but I'm not quite sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, um, Lord Jude. It, the first Hawaii flight was Commander John Rogers, August the 31st, 1925, two Navy aircraft. Thank you for looking that up. They did a good job. Possibly better than the Limburgs. I don't know. But it was harder to find. And um, Yankee Clipper, Easter Island. No, so Easter Island is actually called Rapu Nui. It's one of these films, one of these islands I know about because I worked in a film about it. And it's very isolated, but it's way further south. It's actually off the coast of Chile, where Hawaii is more kind of um, uh, Guatemala. Um, it's 20, latitude of 21. Yeah. And... Um, I am going to say goodbye, but I will answer Rick Roberts. What do I think of zero point energy and is zero point energy real? I think that's a really complicated question. And I think there's a lot of of stuff talked about zero point energy, which isn't true. But I wonder if there's something in it. Because I think we're all being ripped off by electricity. Electricity is just a potential charge. Why are we paying for fossil fuels or nuclear power to be burnt to produce a steam engine that makes electricity when we are surrounded by renewable resources? So I think it's a matter of economics more than physics, zero point energy and it Roll on the day that we're all self-sufficient and don't have to buy gas from nasty Mr. Putin or buy electricity from nasty Mr. Nuclear Fuel, I think. But that's my humble opinion. <laughs> uh, lightning Rod, can you find out how much it would cost to regrow one trillion tons of ice to put a cost on burying fossil fuels? Um, the cost is the rest of humanity's existence. As Robert Llewellyn says, we need to all stop burning stuff. So on, on that note, I think this went um, quite well. And uh, Gafouk, Hi, Gafuk. Yes, I'd like to do this again. I think it probably worked best because I was answering questions that you guys sent in. 
this film will be, this live broadcast will be archived on YouTube. So you can add a comment later today or tomorrow or in the future. And I will read them as I do read all the comments. And um, if you put a um, the word question at the first word in your comments, I can filter them and find questions that maybe we can do this same time, same place next month. As I always say, let me know in the comments below. And thank you all for being loyal viewers. Um, thank you all, especially for supporting me on Patreon and asking such intelligent questions to kick this off. Um, see you all again soon. And remember, because of you, the truth is out there.